three hours into the invasion as a whole, including the Battle of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma within it, a major battle within the South Central invasion sector of the whole nationwide invasion, many combat actions by this point had been well underway with the Tinker Air Force Base and the flank clearing operations among the first to occur, with the Air Force Base by this point having been completely overrun, with many flank clearing operations having had occurred, especially adjacent to the major state and interstate highway systems, where armed reactionary civilians were engaged in large numbers as well as military forces alongside of them. And there were a lot of critical pieces of infrastructure that the military forces had been tasked with defending on the American side of things. Originally, the National Guard of the state of Oklahoma had planned to fully mobilize their entire National Guard forces to protect all the critical infrastructure within Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And they were only able to the point before the invasion to to fully mobilize the 45th Infantry Brigade combat team. There was another military element in the area besides the 45th from the Army, and it came from the Army Reserve, being the 2nd Battalion of the 290th Infantry Regiment, itself a training-oriented battalion. And it was split up, as far as critical infrastructure protection goes, in the western part of the city, with two of its comprising companies defending the water and sewage treatment plant near the OG&E Mustang power plant, just to its northeast, as well as the Will Rogers International Airport, yet another piece of critical, absolutely direly important, of dire importance, infrastructure in this area, as the Will Rogers International Airport was seen by both defender and invader alike as a massively important piece of real estate to hold for the simple reason of logistics. As the massive system of runways at this fairly large international airport could handle ample air traffic, which meant that lots of personnel and lots of logistics could be flown into this airport. And with the economic downturn in the United States prior to the invasion occurring, having had happened, this meant that there were next to no international or even really domestic flights coming in and out of the Will Rogers International Airport or many other airports, as even mentioned in previous videos within this hypothetical documentary series, such as the McAllen Battle and its local international airports. There was almost no air traffic whatsoever at all by the time the invasion began. So, essentially, by this point in time, due to the economic woes being suffered by the nation, these critical pieces of infrastructure were kept afloat primarily by funding coming from the state and federal and local regimes in each individual area. And this included the Will Rogers International Airport. A mix of these military forces from the Army Reserve's 2nd, Bata 2nd Battalion, 290th Infantry Regiment were present guarding the actual airport facility itself with some mixed paramilitary elements, including U.S. Marshals, Bureau of Prisons personnel, which were just to the south at the federal prison complex, the Federal Transfer Center, and of course, others that were present in the area. Now, at the opening of the invasion, these forces, while their maneuver elements including their mechanized infantry, armor, and combat engineers, cleared the flanks and seized control of I-44 and were moving already upon the OG&E power plant by this point in time. At the same time, by 2.30, the Headquarters Battalion and the Air Defense Artillery Battalion of the 17th Combined Arms Brigade were already in the area and busy capturing the prison complex while the Air Defense Artillery Battalion split up its firing companies to surround the airport proper with the Military Police Company of the Headquarters Battalion, basically its 
closest element to a combat force that it had within this battalion besides its combat drone elements that operated the CH-901A loitering munitions and some others were tasked with clearing these structures of enemy personnel. They would not be alone as they would have ample air support coming from a pair of JH-7 ground attack aircraft that had not as of yet jettisoned their payloads and would be overflying the area to provide direct support to these two battalions. The Air Defense Artillery Battalion, although primarily oriented with air threats, was a combat element and its troops had combat training. And they could even utilize their SP AAA 95s in a ground attack role as they could be manually operated or radar operated, as in using the radar to track and act, acquire targets directly. But they could also be manually fired as it related to the quad 25 millimeter autocannons on each of these systems. They also had four short range FN 6. Sur surface-to-air missile systems aboard each vehicle as well, but these, of course, would not be utilized in this role. Just the quad autocannons, which were highly devastating, as these were 25 millimeter quad autocannons. And each firing battery had eight of these systems with a radar and command vehicle per platoon of these vehicles, which meant that the command and radar vehicle was primarily oriented with surveying an even larger area than the radars used on the actual systems themselves and would relay the targeting data to the individual crews of these systems as it appeared. But in this case, as they were being used in a ground uh, ground attack role at this point in time due to there being literally no air threats, these forces would surround the international airport and utilize their weapons to basically keep any defenders within the perimeter from escaping as these quad 25 millimeter cannons would just decimate them if they tried to flee. I mean, none of the vehicles that they had available to them could have survived these systems as essentially the second battalion of the 290th was a lightly equipped force with MRAPs, M113 armor personnel carriers with its strongest vehicle being a Bradley. But because of the air power, the artillery firepower coming from the brigade's own artillery battalion firing their self-propelled type 83 152 millimeter howitzers which would lay down a wall of fire for terrain denial operations to prevent the alpha company encamped just to the west of the airport main terminal structure from being able to reinforce the headquarters of headquarters company over the whole 2nd Battalion of the 290th, which was in the airport and outside in its parking lot where it had some tents set up, this wall of fire would also serve not only as a terrain denial method to prevent reinforcements from being able to stop the military police and some of the air defense forces from capturing the main compound, but it would also serve as direct support as some of the strikes would be precision strikes that were ISR directed on enemy units from the Alpha Company. Alpha Company and the headquarters company of the 2nd Battalion 290th were, the, were they who were, who were present with the paramilitary forces at the airport, while the other two companies of the battalion, it's Bravo and Charlie, were in the north in the water sewage treatment plant that was up there in that area. As it was now going on 3 a.m. by the time the prison had been captured and the area had been thoroughly surrounded by the other firing batteries comprising the Air Defense Artillery Battalion, the cruise missiles that were container-based, as in the calibers, the, the Club K caliber-based cruise missile container systems, and the YJ-18C Chinese container-based cruise missile systems were now firing volleys of their cruise missiles as they, they had begun to fire these at 2 a.m. 
Time to be fired in different salvos at different times, as there were 10,000 of these containers hidden all throughout the country, which each carried four cruise missiles, totaling a grand total of 40,000 of these cruise missiles that would be fired from 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. the next day. These systems would be hitting certain targets that were pre-acquired via intel ascertained from before the invasion even had kicked off as Alpha Company and their tents, their campsite, their bivouac area had been spotted just to the west of the main terminal structure. And there were other targets just to the north of the airport as missiles would overfly the area to hit other targets as well that didn't have anything to do with the battle being partaken at this area at the time. So as 2.30 moved towards 3 a.m., the prison was under full control by the forces that had reached the prison by 2.30, captured it, and then fanned out around the airport proper. And now by 3 the forces were now engaged in the battle over the Will Rogers International Airport itself against the remaining defenders, as they had already eliminated some of these defenders, mostly paramilitary, that were guarding the prison. And as the prison had been captured, it too would serve as a vital piece of infrastructure in the future occupation of the nation, as it would be incorporated into the POW system slash Laogai system, because it would be converted into a Laogai and used for flights of sending future slave laborers back to China from the airport, from that prison terminal. Essentially, as this battle was going on, Special operations troops were just finishing up their phased withdrawal to conduct their operations downtown, including the capture of key political and military figures, in, including even local ones, within the downtown area, as well as to secure crossings for the battalion from the 53rd that was moving up through the center and about to split up when engaging the remainder that survived the intensive 300 millimeter artillery strikes from distant A300 systems firing from the Fort Sill area that completely annihilated whole sections of the entertainment district, as well as the 152 millimeter howitzer shells that had been fired from the opening of the artillery barrage at 1230, landing in the area as well. Now the artillery battalion of the 17th Combined Arms Brigade was shifting all its fire to support the airport battle as its headquarters encapsulating the whole brigade's command elements, most of its logistical elements, and its administrative elements were now reaching the battle, and therefore the artillery had shifted focus to supporting this battle, as it had earlier been heavily saturating this battalion, the 2nd Battalion of the 134th Infantry Regiment, itself one of the National Guard's few airborne units. And going to the battle map of the airport itself, there's a lot of activity going on in this particular battle. At the opening of this map, Two JH-7 ground attack aircraft are swooping in and strafing enemy targets, which include these MRAPs right here. And as you can see, this these two squads of troops running up here, they're encapsulated in red. So they're being hit by the blasting nose cannon ammunition that's shredding these these MRAPs up and definitely eliminating some of these squad members as they flee up this way. And... There's also a lot of movement going on as there is a full air defense company pictured and a platoon from another air defense company. And there's also the military police company from the headquarters battalion. And by this point, as the headquarters battalion now moved into the area just to the south where the prison complex was a bit further away, approximately a kilometer away, where the runways connected to it, 
It fired a fresh volley of CH-901A loitering munitions to support its own military police and the air defense troops who were tasked with capturing this particular facility. Now, the headquarters company over the entire 2nd Battalion, 290th, was camped out in this parking lot between these, these roads that go under these overhangs and around them to where passengers would be picked up and dropped off normally. And they were camped out in this parking lot behind this airport building right here. And the troops of the headquarters company had dug in what used to be a flower bed here, separating these roads here. They dug in and created a foxhole and a machine gun nest in here. And they had established a fence with some checkpoints, like a checkpoint guard area right here where, where this machine gun nest was, and they put up a fence right here that was like a checkpoint. And they had a few soldiers manning it, about four of them or a half squad. And then they had a squad in the foxhole. They had troops encamped out here in the parking lot. They had troops inside this building. And they had troops out here guarding the eastern facing side of the terminal area, as well as troops controlling the entrance and exit to the main terminal facility here, where all the international flights were and also domestic flights. To the west of the facility was the Alpha Company and its campsite, where they were camped out approximately 800 meters away or almost a kilometer away across these across the taxiway and some of these runways here and at the time as the cruise missiles were coming in one had already hit right here as indicated by this missile strike marker leaving a big crater and had destroyed one of their m113s artillery fire at the opening of this map was already saturating the area thoroughly as at the opening of this map, there are 16 total blasts, which indicate two batteries of the artillery battalion of its firing batteries are literally putting up a wall of shrapnel right here from the artillery fire. And these markers are, are indicative of imminent artillery strikes. Now, one platoon of Alpha Company had their camp right here along this tarmac and away from the taxiway a bit about 800 meters away as mentioned and a cruise missile had come in and struck a part of their campsite they had their other platoons camped out just a little bit further to the west now initially as intended the terrain denial strikes launched by the artillery forces had achieved their objective and prevented reinforcements from Alpha Company from reaching the main terminals, which would have made their capture a bit harder for the forces of the military police tasked with going in and thoroughly clearing this area, supported by air defense troops who were ringing the entire airport to prevent enemy forces from fleeing and also to give limited direct support by firing their very potent quad 25mm autocannons from each SP AAA-95 system at enemy targets as needed. The volley of CH-901A loitering munitions with a fresh volley of 48 of them fired from the nearby, approximately one kilometer south located, drone sections of the... Headquarters Battalion now entering the map. There's 34 shown on this map with more on the way. The other the other 14 of them. These forces, these two MRAPs, are being hit by these CH-901A loitering munitions. These were all armed with heat warheads. And although they weren't sure initially of whether they wanted to arm them with HE or heat. They ended up going for the heat warheads because they wanted to be extra sure that if there were any vehicles that were more potent than an MRAP or an armored personnel carrier, such as the Bradleys that were known to be operated by the Alpha Company, they wanted to make sure that those would be completely destroyed because 
The attacking forces, again, were air defense forces and military police. Now, although the force, the American forces, were already in disarray from the lack of ISR assets, the lack of communications, and essentially being a lightly equipped force overall, as essentially this was just a headquarters company here in this airport and some paramilitary forces that were in SWAT gear, and that was really it other than the Alpha Company that had more substantial equipment located in their campsites off to the west, they wanted to be absolutely sure that a very high proportion of force in terms of supporting these forces was applied in order to ensure that these forces would not be able to create any meaningful casualties amongst the attacking forces as again military police were ordinarily tasked with of course enforcing military law and code but they were also used as a security element for the headquarters battalion as a whole and they were not a frontline combat force, although they were well equipped for combat and trained for it, they were not a frontline combat force and were primarily a rear area security oriented force. Although because the American forces defending this area were perceived as relatively light and weak, it was decided that the headquarters and the air defense battalion were enough to handle this with the air support they received from the JH-7s, heavy artillery support from their own artillery battalion within the 17th Combined Arms Brigade, and their own drone support from their own headquarters battalion launching CH-901As, not to mention the cruise missile strikes coming in from these YJ-18C container-based cruise missiles, which were targeted specifically against Alpha Company. So... All in all, when they did their risk assessments and calculations, they decided that instead of sending a maneuver unit to capture the installation after they'd achieved other objectives, they decided it would be more expedient and faster and more efficient to just go ahead and use the headquarters battalions, elements such as the MP company and the air defense artillery elements such as the firing batteries of that comprise the air defense artillery battalion as just the air defense troops alone had enormous firepower at their disposal and the artificial intelligence network that created these risk assessments and calculations had determined that the sheer volume of firepower that these were fully capable of delivering was more than enough to dish out massive punishment on these light forces of the Americans. So hence it was decided that instead of wasting time and waiting for maneuver units to complete their other tasks and get to the airport, they would go ahead and send elements of the headquarters battalion and the air defense battalion lacking any meaningful air targets as there were none it was decided not to let these forces go to waste and utilize them in a ground attack role as they were fully capable of it, as these SP-AAAs could be manually aimed by the operators and fired at ground targets. Although for the FN-6, that wasn't the case, but it was the case for the quad 25 millimeter cannons. These forces, by this point, as these missiles crisscrossed over the sky and went for their different targets. These in particular flying further afield while these two were pursuing the Alpha Company and hitting targets of theirs with one already having had hit and destroyed a portion of their vehicles that were literally under this missile marker that were destroyed in the crater and their campsite and the other battalions that were, or I mean the other, the other platoons of this company of this battalion that were encamped further to the West, just a little bit, they were all being hit by a volley of the CH 901 A's armed with their heat warheads, 
which came crashing down on and destroyed these two MRAPs with ease in conjunction with artillery strikes that were immediately inbound, and the missile strikes and artillery strikes immediately inbound on these forces all came together to lay down an enormous layer of destruction as these forces in their campsite were hit by three different systems, all hitting them roughly at the same time, between the loitering munitions, the 152 millimeter artillery shells from the Type 83 howitzers, and the cruise missiles, which were highly destructive in the form of the pre-targeted YJ-18Cs that had targeted their campsite as it had already been here before the invasion had kicked off and was pre-selected as a target. As for the forces of the headquarters company that were camped out in the parking lot area between the terminal buildings and within the buildings themselves with some paramilitary elements, these forces would be taken by the military police company that operated Tiger MRAPs as their vehicle. They, they had their vehicles equipped with 12.7 millimeter machine guns as their crew serve turret machine guns for these MRAPs. And these MRAPs were tough vehicles. They weren't as well armored as, say, a tank or an infantry fighting vehicle, but they were comparable in some ways to certain armor personnel carriers, although there were some armor personnel carriers that were much better armored than the MRAPs, but these were definitely enough to withstand small arms fire and, to an extent, certain crew serve weapons as well. And as these military police and air defense forces, these signify a SPAAA-95, SPAAA-95, that's what this is here. This is their radar command vehicle for each platoon right here of the batteries. This is their headquarters Comp, uh, headquarters platoon of the battery that's pictured. And there's elements of another battery pictured that, with more off the map, as there are one battery, I mean, one, one platoon right here, these four vehicles, these four SP-AAA-95s, and then the rest belonging to this company right here, this, this air defense artillery company right here. So basically, what you have is 12 SP-AAA-95s with the two firing platoons of the battery that's fully in this map, having their two command radar command vehicles and then their headquarters vehicles with the command elements over the whole battery right here, including their armored recovery vehicle. These SP-AAA-95s were an armored vehicle. These could take some punishment. I mean, these were essentially like a similar style chassis to an armored personnel carrier, in other words. They, they weren't as well armored as an infantry fighting vehicle, but they could still take quite a bit of punishment from small arms. And although... Though as well armored as these SP-AAA-95s were and the MRAPs were, they would be taking a little bit of punishment in the attack against the international airport. Although due to the sheer superiority with the loitering munitions, cruise missiles, artillery fire coming in, and even air power coming in with these two JH-7s that hadn't, as of this point, jettisoned any of their munitions yet, while the others had already been utilized. These were the last two to jettison their munitions out of the squadron. And they wouldn't even need to do so in this instance, as they would just be used in strafing attacks against enemy targets, primarily causing havoc behind the terminal buildings themselves by flying in and strafing these forces back here, eliminating many of them in their strafing attack, while the air defense troops and military police 
moved in to seize control over the facility proper. Now, the onloading and offloading ramps of these terminals were badly damaged and destroyed by the artillery fire. Much of the facility would, however, be taken relatively intact. Although the scars of war, such as the vast numbers of small arms being fired, that would end up being fired inside of it and smacking it on the outside would pockmark it and leave it battle scarred. For the most part, the buildings were left off limits to direct artillery or missile strikes or airdropped munitions as they wanted as much of this place intact as was possible. And even though they used a few cruise missiles against the Alpha Company out here, they would send engineering forces to repair these runways upon having successfully captured the installation or the, the airport the International Airport, and following up the victory over Oklahoma City as a whole, they would then send the forces to repair anything that needed repaired. For the time being, however, the defending forces had essentially dug in in certain areas like, had, like they had done in this former flower bed that separated these roads leading up to the terminals right here and they had also dug in along the taxiway and this and this runway right here and they had a squad of dismounts right here a squad of dismounts right here these were headquarters company troops and a squad right here and they had troops they had a driver tc and gunner in each of these vehicles here this belonging to a platoon of the headquarters company these vehicles part of another platoon of the headquarters company, this one, this one, this one, and this one, and these part of the last platoon of the headquarters company, with these having been doing roving patrols at the time that this battle broke out and these loitering munitions and artillery strikes came in and destroyed them. Essentially, what occurred was the opening movements of the battle as these forces slowly rolled into the area they had been firing their quad auto cannons at the structure because they were taking some fire from some of these areas that were the on and off loading ramps connected to directly. They had been taking fire from some of these areas and were determined to suppress that fire. And they had fired the 25 millimeter auto cannons where, wherever they were taking fire from, from these buildings and were completely annihilating the enemy forces, although there was an incident where the Chinese forces suffered a loss and they had lost one of their SP AAA 95s because as they were laying down enormous fire against all these forces over here, as this one was rolling further up, a tow missile had been fired from within this on and off loading ramp as this one hadn't as of yet been fired from, so therefore it wasn't directly engaged yet. There was a few personnel that had moved a tow system from inside this terminal building to this on and off loading ramp and had fired the tow system out at this vehicle right here because they could, they could see it well and they decided to go for it instead of the MRAPs or any of these over here because... They viewed the SP AAA-95 as a much more potent enemy threat and destroyed it to try to give support to their troops that were already out here and fighting and quickly being eliminated. Now, the fighting drew out these MRAPs right here behind these fences that connected these these the main terminal building here with these smaller terminals for local flights and other buildings that, that were part of the airport, like the fire station and all the other stuff. They, they drew these MRAPs out from behind these corners here where there were fences and everything. They, they came out to try to support their troops that were in this trench line right here, as well as to support their troops that were dismounted here, their dismounted forces. There was a squad here, one here and one here. And, 
they as they moved out, they were already being heavily engaged by 12.7 millimeter fire, 25 millimeter auto cannon fire, and it was these 25 millimeter auto cannons especially that shredded these MRAPs into literal pieces. I mean, they they were they were gone where they stood. I mean, as they rolled up to the corner right here, they they were firing their M250 cal machine guns at these forces, and they were doing a lot of damage to the Chinese MRAPs, but the SP AAA 95s that were in the area, including this one that had moved in here, were firing heavy volumes of 25 millimeter autocannon rounds that shredded these vehicles up as the 12.7 millimeter machine guns were steadily shredding up these dismounts. And although they were also pelting the MRAPs, the MRAPs could withstand some of the 12.7 millimeter fire while they could not withstand 25 millimeter autocannon fire. And as these military police and these forces here are all rolled up, having had lost one of their SP AAA 95s from this other from this other firing uh, battery, and it, it's one platoon of four vehicles here. This one had moved in here to aid these that were firing through the MRAPs at these forces here, like firing between them, and had moved had moved in here and then had gone around here to be able to fire better through these fences and through these buildings. And by this point, these forces moved in to secure the flanks, basically. They, 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 these MRAPs here of MPs had rolled here first, where you see these first movements as they were steadily rolling forward between the firefight that was going on where all these forces were exchanging fire with one another. And these forces of this platoon of MPs had rolled around this way to protect the flanks of their forces that were trying to move in to start storming these buildings. So essentially, they, their ISR assets had pinpointed that most of the American resistance was coming from this area for the time being, as the rest of their forces were in here getting strafed by the JH-7 swooping down and strafing, causing havoc in this area, simply shredding up these vehicles and KIAing a lot of these troops of these squads here. Basically, they got all of them because you see this arrows encapsulated in red. They were all destroyed. This MRAP, this MRAP, and these troops by the strafing attack going on by these these ground attack aircraft before they before they pulled up after doing so and continued circling the area and prepared to fly back in to either strafe or drop munitions if it was deemed necessary to even do so because again, as it related to airdrop munitions or air fired munitions or crews or tactical ballistic missiles or artillery, these buildings were generally off limits for that. Although they damaged these on and offloading ramps with the artillery, they did not outright try to destroy the terminals themselves. They could fix these ramps, but they couldn't. It, it would take far too much effort to try to fix the terminal in any meaningful amount of time. The runway would be relatively simple to fix, as all they would have to do is come in and just patch up the holes. But as for the buildings, they tried to lay off the buildings because they were to be part of the future forward operating base as the occupation phase was to set in. And again, the wall of fire, the heavy artillery fire, cruise missile strikes... The, the strikes from these loitering munitions all came in and decimated Alpha Company. And any stragglers from Alpha Company who tried to flee were picked off by other air defense batteries that comprised the air defense battalion as a whole. With again, one full battery pictured in this picture with the military police company and a platoon from another firing battery pictured with more off the map as they encircled the airport proper. These Americans had no idea they were being surrounded, just like everywhere else, due to no ISR assets, no communications, nothing except what they could see in front of them and what type of messages they could pass by mouth to one another as the electronic warfare jamming ensured that their radios and even portable radar sets, if they were, where applicable, did not work. 
So as these forces continued moving in to guard the flanks as they suppressed and destroyed these forces here, including the MRAPs, by laying down heavy 25mm autocannon fire on them, destroying them as they tried to maneuver around to support their forces that were already in the prone position here and here in this wedge formation and those that were trying to keep their heads down in this trench. These military police MRAPs rolled up as close as they could before dismounting their dismounted military police troops who went up against the trench and fired down into it and threw a few grenades into it over here and completely eliminated all these troops. While this MRAP and this MRAP had been gradually coming around this way, laying fire this way until they could get close and dismount their troops here and here as well which upon them taking out these troops here, and these guys already have been, been wiped out by these vehicles, these three MRAPs from this platoon coming up here and spreading out here. It was now safe for the military police to begin to storm the building itself, the, the, inst the airport proper, as by this point, as these different platoons of MPs are all interspersed, there's one full platoon of them right here, and there's another platoon right here, and there's one platoon here, and the last platoon is down here. Five MRAPs apiece of the military police platoons. So they dismounted their MPs, and they basically the dismounted MPs were four squads right here. So you had one dismount here, one here, one here, and one here. And they all bounded and covered carefully before reaching the building with two squads going in this way and one climbing up and into the into the ramp right here with the other one here going down and under the ramp over here to the to the corner area where they were now beginning to take a little bit of fire from troops that were coming down running away from further off the map because they were realizing they were surrounded they had tried to flee the area but they were now coming back and these forces from this squad that, that went here and attacked a trench that bounded over it, we're now moving up to take this corner, and then they bounded forward to take the corner as well, preparing to smash through the fencing to attack this portion of the now devastated campsite and these buildings right here. While these other squads, three total, had gone into the building from this end, while earlier, these SP AAA 95s had moved up here, and while they were taking some fire, they had laid down fire this way to support this MP vehicle dropping off a squad here from one of the MP platoons to go in through this ramp right here, this former on and offloading ramp to the aircraft. While this one came up here and was earlier taking fire, before this movement even took place after the firefights died out here, they had moved here and were taking fire, but they were firing this way and they had dismounted their squad to go in before the fire from the, the resistance from these forces had died out. And this squad was dismounted to go in here from this MRAP and then this MRAP came up and dismounted a squad here. This SP AAA-95 had moved up closer and then went this way while this MRAP moved up and dismounted a squad to go in before the SP AAA moved over here to guard the flanks because, again, they could fire through all this if there were any enemy forces coming. And these vehicles remained over here from this MP platoon that dropped off one of their squads. They left the rest of their platoon on guard over here. There are other four MRAPs and these other two SP AAA 95s from one of the firing platoons of the battery that's located in this map with only one platoon from a different battery up here. Now, as these forces went through thoroughly 
trying to clear the building, they got in an enormous firefight inside the airport. I mean, this to clear the entire airport building for these military police took in grand total about an hour. I mean, this was a this was a drawn out battle. I mean, they were fighting in all the corridors and lobbies and rooms and everywhere. I mean, they had to go through these through these humongous terminal buildings, thoroughly clearing them of any American forces. And the forces that came in this way by this fence line remained here because there was still ample enemy activity in this area, even though the air attacks had badly shredded up and decimated these forces, including this MRAP fleeing up this way as it was taking fire from through the fence and also fire from the earlier air attacks that came in and decimated these AMRAPs and these troops that were fleeing this area. Because when the battle broke out, they were all within their tents. They had no idea what happened when all the comms went down. They didn't know what was going on until the artillery began to strike. And when the artillery really began to strike and they began to hear all the noise and chaos of the war around them, it spurred them into action as it was immediately within their vicinity because earlier when they heard it, heard it in the distance, they didn't know what to make of it. And they knew that something bad was happening, but they didn't know exactly what until it came upon them. And it was too late because by then they were surrounded within the first basically two and a half hours of the whole invasion. But really only two hours into the battle at Fort or I mean, the battle at OKC as a whole, because Oklahoma City's battle officially began at 1230 as far as contact between forces with the artillery fire. Because although the invasion officially began at midnight with the tandem satellite cyber strikes and the electronic warfare being booted on, the contact didn't begin until 1230 in this particular battle of the invasion. That was to basically allow for as much movement and preparation as possible to allow for the air support to also arrive and contribute decisively to the combat. And the air support arrived by 1.40 a.m. So between 2.30, I mean 12.30 and 1.40, there was a lot of artillery fire and movement. And then when the air power arrived, first objectives began to be captured in rapid succession. Now, as these forces worked to clear this airport, these forces held the line and, and continued to lay down fire from their positions to hit these remaining surviving troops on their flanks, completely wiping out these groupings of troops here and continuing to hold their position until these troops here were completely flushed out. These paramilitary forces and headquarters company troops within this main terminal structure were cleared by these dismounted MP squads that went into this building and began to clear it methodically, including others that came in from this way. Now, as that occurred, these forces had destroyed these two MRAPs that came down here early on while they were fighting these squads here as they moved into place. They were hit from the sides by HJ-08 anti-tank missiles that were operated by the MPs, as well as even being fired at between these squads, remember this is all AI and ISR directed, at these forces too. And they were pressed up against the walls. And as these forces had thoroughly cleared this, these, these main structures out, they began to exchange fire with the Americans of the company, of the headquarters company, of this platoon that were still in this building and in this machine gun nest. While these forces now moved into the area to assist in the capture of this building right here with these three squads in it and the machine gun nest with a squad and, of course, a half squad manning this checkpoint right here. So essentially what happened was they destroyed these last few MRAPs and these last groupings of troops, these last 12 troops, which is a squad and a half that survived the strafing attacks and all that, and they basically maneuvered their way around to hold the corner and fight these guys in the machine gun nest and threw a few grenades in there and fighting the guys at the checkpoint while these guys were firing at them from this way because you can see they were returning fire as this green indicates along this building they were on the first floor firing out against each other 
allowing for them to move into this building once they had basically finished off these forces out here. And they were even exchanging fire at each other from these buildings. But when they wiped out the guys by the doors here, they they bounded across this, this road right here to capture the building. In conjunction with these forces entering through this way, while these forces held the outdoors to hold their position and secure the area. So essentially, this became another battle within the battle to capture this building within the larger airport facility. As by this point, the terminals, especially this main terminal, had been thoroughly cleared. Again, it took a while to do this. It took, it took a lot of time to actually achieve this. It took about an hour. And then they went into this building, and it took even more time to clear that. So all in all, this battle for this airport between the military police, air defense troops, with their ample artillery support, missile support, CH-901A loitering munition support, air support, this in grand total was a, basically a two-hour battle. It was a two-hour battle that lasted from 2.30 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. But even while this battle had been going on, ample other things were also occurring at the same time throughout the map insofar as combat experiences, including the fighting going on downtown with the special operators and half of a mechanized infantry battalion from the 53rd, while other heavy maneuver forces from the 190th Combined Arms Brigade and 118th had moved into the downtown area to cordon the area, which would take a while to methodically clear due to the way the downtown was arranged and the, and the nature of its buildings and its underground areas. It would take a while to achieve this. This battle for OKC lasted two full days with most of the combat winding down by day one, but residual combat occurring for a full 48 hours before the city was completely under Chinese control. In the next video, the special operations mission, the strike to capture key regime members and even some military leadership will be explored in the CAP complex as well as the fighting that w occurred in future videos here in the entertainment district and in this part of downtown against the local regime leadership. To be followed up by other battles, such as the og &E Frontier Plant battle, the fighting between these two mechanized infantry battalions and the combat engineer battalion, the 545th Brigade Engineer Battalion against the same two battalions from the 53rd Combined Arms Brigade and 93rd Combined Arms Brigade that had carried out these actions here against the armed civilians and the 1st of the 279th. And also their next battle after that against the 1st Squadron 180th Cav, as it would manifest itself finally, being discovered by the ISR assets re coming out of the buildings that had been acquired by Chinese intelligence reports that ascertained that the unit was actually in this area to begin with, but the vehicles had not as of yet come out of the buildings and they wanted to make for sure that the unit was there before they began to fire enormous munitions at this area in particular. This was a relatively long battle once again, and there is much more to be explored in the next videos.